there anybody else on the call? This is Stephanie. Yeah, a lot of people just say I'm here, just yeah, say thanks, I'm on the call, thanks. I don't know why they're all, hi Stephanie, here. just say thank you. I just assigned to you a map. Just answer those, you know, you just answer those, so just say hi, I'm here, or anything, just say thanks. But then, yeah, anything you see, clinical questions. And I've got my procedure on my double screen because I've got my stuff in case. Yeah, 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 that's fine. But any of these simple ones, just say thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. You know, I didn't see them all come in all of a sudden.
Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Stephanie with the NCC. We will be starting very shortly. We are having a little audio problems. I don't know if you can hear me or not, uh, but please, we will start this uh, presentation shortly. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Stephanie with the NCC, and we will get started very shortly. Just give us another minute or two, waiting for a few more people to, to join. Hello? Hi, Jessica? Hi. Yay. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. I'm just waiting for Dr. Chopra, and I just sent them both. So both to you, so. Okay. Perfect.
Hello. This is Stephanie. Everybody's in, Hi, so Stephanie. I'm going to go ahead and get. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. So, um, let me roll right into it. Um, all right, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning. This is Stephanie Hall with yeah. the NCC, and um, I'm going to go over a couple things before we get into our presentation for today. Uh, this is the uh, End Stage Renal Disease Network Learning in Action Series. It's our home modality quality improvement activity. I want to just go over a couple things before we get started today. For some of you that are new to this, uh, platform this year, we changed a little bit from last year, so some things may look a little different, but I do want to remind everybody, we are streaming the audio over the computer. We have limited about number of phone lines that are going to be available. If you absolutely need a phone line, please uh, send us a, a, a question via the chat. Otherwise, you should be able to connect using your speakers on, on your computer. Uh, we um, echoes sometimes happen, and echoes can be caused by multiple connections to a single event. So please close all but one browser. And if you do have a phone line, uh, have a question, all our phone lines are muted today. But please uh, submit any questions for our presenters today during the event via the Ask a Question box. Um, if, if your audio from your computer speakers start to break up or they suddenly stop. Hit the F5 button located at the top row of your keyboard, or click the refresh button uh, located at the on your toolbar at the top left-hand side of your computer. Like I mentioned, if you want to submit questions, we do want to hear from you today. Uh, please submit them via the Ask a Question section located on the left-hand side of your screen. And the reason for the land today, uh, we. I want to learn today why education is the key to growing a successful home program. In just a few minutes, you are going to hear from our presenters um, <clears throat> about how they've been successful in getting patients to go on to home programs. And we ask that you, uh, as you're listening through this presentation today, just uh, listen for some best practices, think about things that you can take back to your facility that you can share, that you can implement that will help uh, move your patients onto the any uh, home modality. So we're going to before we do get into the presentation for today, I do want to share with you. Many of you took the time to answer our pre-work questions that we sent out. So I do want to review with them with everybody today. The first question that we sent out was, does the home program that you work with provide the urgent start peritoneal dialysis and um, we had around 480 people respond to that question, and actually 60% or 291 said yes, they do have a urgent start PD program, and almost 40% said they do not. So thank you for your feedback on that. And our second question was, does the facility where you work have a transitional care unit? And again, out of 483, uh, only 9% said they do have a transitional care unit, and the rest, the 91%, said no, they do not have a transitional care unit. So, so I'm going to have two presenters today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them both, uh, be and then you'll have an opportunity at the end of the presentation and during the presentation to submit questions for both speakers and we will have time at the end of the presentation to go over many, as many as we can of these questions. So our first speaker is Dr. Copra. He's the medical director of University of Virginia Stanton a Dialysis Unit in Stanton, Virginia. Dr. Copra is also an assistant professor of medicine, a division of nephrology at the University of Virginia Health System. He serves on the National Kidney Foundation of Virginia Medical Advisory Board and is a member of the Mid-Atlantic Renal Coalition ESRD Network 5 Medical Review Board. Also today, we have Jessica Jenkins. She is the nurse manager of the University of Virginia, uh, where she has a transitional care unit. Um, and I'll start turn the presentation over to Dr. Chopra. 
Thank you, Stephanie, and um, thank you, audience, for taking time um, to listen to us. Our presentation briefly is going to be on growing home dialysis and how we have been successful uh, in growing our home program. And these are my disclosures, which Stephanie has already spoken about. But the objectives that I want from this talk is uh, they start from CKD Clinic, where we need to develop a roadmap towards kidney health, what sort of educational tools we have available, and the importance of giving options to our patients. Overall, what is the outcomes in home dialysis modalities? It is important to understand them while we present options to patients. Whether we need to remodel delivery of home dialysis, and is our home dialysis or in-center unit thinking of home-to-home -home transition between modalities? Those are the objectives of my talk. So coming to the aim of a home dialysis program, any home dialysis program wants to keep patients on appropriate, effective, and desired therapy. This is the current status of home dialysis trends amongst prevalent dial and renal disease patients using uh, the NST, uh, USRDS database, which is from 2015. But as you can see, the trends in peritoneal dialysis, which is the yellow line, is uprising. Home hemodialysis is lagging a little bit, but it is also on the uprise. In the United States, the home hemodialysis population is less than 5%, while peritoneal dialysis is on the rise. Why do we do home dialysis? Now, in chronic kidney disease as well as end-stage, home dialysis enables us to teach patients to manage their disease by themselves. It is the job of the dialysis team to get them up to speed with self-management. It's a very complex job to allay anxieties of patients, but it can be very rewarding in the end, both for the patient as well as the dialysis team, to make our patient more independent and give them autonomy. There is also a healthcare system initiative like the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, where the executive order is stating we need to improve home dialysis utilization, as well as improve the quality of patient-centered treatment given to dialysis patients. I have presented this as a hub and spoke model, where the hub is the executive order in the middle, and the spokes I have outlined on the side. Things we can concentrate on are either educating patients, educating the nephrologists, trying to preserve residual renal function, being innovative in using home dialysis technologies, new PD fluids, and the new machines that are out there, and trying to revamp the delivery of uh, home dialysis, thinking of transitional start units, having an urgent start program, using telehealth or telemedicine, thinking of home-to-home -home transitions, and even thinking whether assist PD can be a possibility in America. This is a very complicated slide. It is going over factors affecting PD utilization within a healthcare system, and it is including all sorts of factors that could be um, implied in your system. Every organization and health system has to do some introspection to try and find out what is it in their um, area that is the rate limiting step to utilization of home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. For example, facility factors, whether there is a clinician bias in referring patients to home dialysis modalities, whether we need to improve the confidence of the physician in treating home patients, or is there a problem with PD catheter placement? Sometimes it's uh, not having the right personnel to place the PD catheter, or the timing of placing the PD catheter is months apart. So those are facility factors. There could be PD fluid factors. If you remember a few years ago, there was a PD fluid shortage that happened in America, which led to underutilization of peritoneal dialysis. And we were able to circumvent that problem only when we started importing fluids from Ireland. That way, there can be patient factors and outcome factors, which we will go over in detail. But the health system factor that is favoring the utilization of peritoneal dialysis is the PD favored policy and the executive order that is incentivizing organizations as well as uh, physicians to provide appropriate desired therapy to our patients, which is through the executive order. 
Again, in the health system factors, you can see that the urban environment versus rural environment could be factors. If you're in a rural setting, it is more likely that someone is going to be uh, doing peritoneal dialysis where in-center units are not around. So one has to keep this chart in mind and figure out what is it in their system that is the rate limiting step. Education is the key. We have to give the patient free informed choice of doing uh, home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Now, why I bring this up? In 2002, Network 18 had done a survey in a, at least 230 dialysis patients, and the survey included uh, how well they were educated in the pre-CKD or pre-dialysis uh, era. As you can see, out of uh, 220 participants, 6% don't even remember that options were presented to them. 10% said there was no time uh, spent with them discussing options. Only 35% of uh, patients said, my doctor spent at least 30 minutes discussing education about modalities. Over here in University of Virginia, we give an options talk as a part of our pre and regional disease education program. The reason for giving options is because the patients need to know all modalities that are available to them. They need to know the risks and benefits of each modality so they can weigh the risks and benefits of these modalities before coming to a decision based on their goals. This is an education qualitative tool. It's called the Match D, uh, which was developed by Dori Chattel. As you can see, that this is a qualitative tool. It is very good for nurses and staff and technicians to see what are the relative indications and contraindications of peritoneal dialysis. On the right hand side, which is red, are absolute contraindications. On the left hand side, which is green, are uh, indications of doing peritoneal dialysis, and in between is the gray zone. What I want to emphasize is that these are not hard and fast rules. The only absolute contraindication to doing peritoneal dialysis would be not having an intact peritoneum. We uh, have to keep that in mind, but this is a good qualitative tool that um, uh, technicians can use while they are talking to patients on the machine. Similarly, we have another match D tool uh, available for home hemodialysis patients, again going over color-coded fashion, the indications and the contraindications of home hemodialysis. Coming back to that survey, where we were discussing the importance of education. The results of the survey were that there were two important determinants that um, uh, determined whether a patient would be taking up home dialysis. One was the time that was spent by the provider in explaining them options. And second was whether they were even told that other options were available, like um, uh, automated PD or CAPD. So those were the two main things that were the rate determining steps in education uh, that would influence the uptake of home dialysis modalities. So what are the advantages of education? Of course, there are advantages to the patients. It gives informed choice uh, to the patients, empowers them. It will improve the doctor-patient relationship, compliance. It will improve outcomes after starting dialysis, and it's very fundamental for long-term survival. It's also important to educate nephrologists because of the they, nephrologists need to learn the value and timing of communication. It needs to be an integral part of their training curriculum and it will also improve their willingness to prescribe that therapy once they're more confident about it. So that was about education. We're gonna switch gears to outcomes. What is important is patient priorities and perspectives. Patient is thinking length of life and survival, but is also thinking of quality of life, what, whether they want to stay employed, whether they want to achieve some familial milestones. Some patients just want to feel better. Some want to get a transplant. These goals have to be developed with the team. These two, quality of life and length of life, are not mutually exclusive. This is the basis of the outcome studies of home dialysis. No randomized trials have been done, all registry data. They have been controlled for propensity scores, marginal structural analysis, 
Bottom line is survival of PD is improving over time. Survival of hemodialysis is unchanged. So the survival between the two modalities is essentially the same. A survival difference of 30 days should not be an indication for one form of dialysis or another. So is the glass half empty or the glass half full? Previous studies were saying that there was an early survival advantage of peritoneal dialysis compared to three times a week hemodialysis. Whether it was something good about PD, like preserved residual renal fraction, or it was something bad about hemodialysis, like urgent stats or tunnel catheters. There were two papers that looked at this by Dr. Barkman. As you can see, when they compared peritoneal dialysis patients to hemodialysis patients with a planned start, which means they had a functioning AV fistula or AV graft, there was no early survival advantage for PD. There was no change in time over uh, late survival disadvantage for PD, even in diabetics. So the time limit for PD with an elective change to hemodialysis is not actually necessary if you start the patient well. This is describing what the older studies were saying, that there was an early survival advantage for PD. That was because there were sicker patients in urgent start hemodialysis patients that were dying. The late survival benefit for HD was because only HD patients were living. Currently, the current studies are saying that both patients are dying at the same rate, so the survival outcomes are equal. Switching to whether access matters, the same paper also looked at the graph of whether central venous catheter compared to other accesses is related to outcome. The yellow line is saying that if you have a central venous catheter, your outcome is worse compared to somebody who has peritoneal dialysis catheter or they have um, uh, AV fistula or AV graft. PD access is associated with lower primary failure rate, as you can see in the graph. This was a study with 300 plus incident patients and they looked at patency um, and uh, statistics in one year. Fewer access interventions were done, lower interventional rate was done, lower rates of primary access failure was found if you had a PD catheter. There are miscellaneous medical influences that could be advantages like lower risk of dementia, equal hospitalization rates for infections when you compared peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis patients. But what is important to the patient needs to be kept in mind. This pyramid is what we all need to focus on. What matters most to the patient is health-related quality of life. Measures of effectiveness that we are looking at is what is the patient's experience of their dialysis? How much are they getting hospitalized? How are they living? And of course, in the bottom line is the basics that we look at, which is hemoglobin, adequacy, um, like renal bone disease. Those are the basis of this, but patients care more about how they live, not how long they live. Registry survival studies are very expensive. They keep giving up with the same results. So we have to keep in mind how often does our patient ask us which modality will let them live the longest. This is going over life participation activities amongst different forms of dialysis. Several uh, reports of survey data which says that PD patient is more likely to be active as compared to a uh, in-center hemodialysis patient. One of these studies also had a, a Fitbit. This goes over employment rates on different dialysis modalities. This is from the 2728 data which was published and you can see that a CAPD patient, a CCPD patient, from 1992 to 2003 was more likely to be employed as opposed to an in-center hemodialysis patient, and hence, of course, contributing to economy. Coming to expenditure, this is the expenditure that uh, Medicare has in a home uh, uh, in different forms of dialysis. In-center dialysis costs $90,000, peritoneal dialysis is 76, and transplant is $34,000. In the incremental uh, cost effectiveness ratio, if there is a um, um, cost in the numerator and effectiveness in the denominator, one has to keep in mind that effectiveness of home dialysis modality is a little better with quality of life and mortality is not so different and the cost is a little less in the numerator, so it is a more cost effective modality. So why should we opt for home dialysis and explain it to our patients? because it preserves residual renal functions. We don't use central venous catheter as much, which is associated with worse mortality. 
more better quality of life. It's a cost-effective modality, and it enables the dialysis team to self-manage long-term illness. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about remodeling delivery of PD. Urgent start. A lot of you have urgent start protocols, and I'm just going to recap that. You need to start patients within two weeks after catheter placement. Try to use low volume supine cycler dialysis. You can do it outpatient, you can do it inpatient. Treatment normally occurs six to eight hours, three times or five times a week, depending on how you remake the patient is. All patients should be given dialysis education. If deemed PD candidate, they need to be given formal recommendations. If PD is chosen, formal uh, referral should be played for PD catheter. PD should be initiated as in-center IPD. Sometimes we try to use PD plus hemodialysis approach in a very hyperkalemic, volume overloaded, uremic patient just to make sure that they are optimized to do uh, to get the PD catheter placed. But as soon as possible, we have to remove the HD catheter. These are the urgent start protocols that are available so far. As you can see, uh, the person putting the PD catheter could be a surgeon, could be a vast interventional radiologist or, or um, an interventional nephrologist. The dwelling time can be 500 to 1,000 depending on body size. And the frequency could be three times daily or five times a week with inpatient or outpatient initiation. Oh, and Dr. Chopra, we're going, we need to do a polling question right there was inserted there. We'll just okay. take a moment to um, get the audience. Let me go ahead and get that um, get that survey out here for the audience to participate. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm sending it out to everybody now. So the question going out to the audience: Please indicate the most significant benefit or benefits to telehealth telemedicine in PD. So we'll just give everybody just a little bit of time to answer that question, and then we can share out the results with everybody. So Thanks. they, oh, there they come. They're starting to come on in. So got quite a variety of answers. Let's just give everybody just a little bit longer. And to all the participants, please remember you will have to close out the survey in order to move on to the next slide. So when we're done and I close it, please remember to close it also on your end so you can continue to see the slide deck. Uh, I'm going to close the results now in uh, three, two, and one. And I will send these out. So it looks like um, some of the answers to the question, please indicate the most significant benefits to telehealth or telemedicine in PD. Uh, we had about 15% said improved quality of life, 17 and a half said reduced hospitalizations or ED visits, 14% said it was cost-effective method, 9.5% uh, said uh, patient and provider satisfaction, and all of them, and for all of the above, about 44.6% said that. So thank you, everybody, for um, participating in our survey, and I will get that back over to the slides. Okay, doctor, you're back up. Thanks, Stephanie. So yes, telehealth is one way to remodel delivery of uh, peritoneal dialysis. There are various ways in which telehealth can be provided, which is video conferencing, real-time chat, using iPad or cellular data, remote monitoring devices or cloud share, which is available through CCPDs, and interactive software with image transfer uh, in order to um, provide, allow PD to be done in remote areas. Uh, there, are, there are studies that have come out of Europe, actually, on um, video conferencing as well as on um, uh, remote data monitoring and trying to prevent uh, hospitalizations with good outcomes. The teleconferencing, um, unfortunately, the cost of technology was the limiting factor, and uh, remote data monitoring had much better outcomes with hospitalization and more changes in PD prescription. So the advantages of telemedicine is increased access to healthcare services, enhanced access to specialists, improved quality of life, 
reduced hospitalization, a very cost-effective method and with a lot of patient and provider satisfaction. Increased home dialysis volume and more market share. The cost of this technology has to be kept in mind when you're trying to work out the hospitalization rates. I'm going to switch over to Jessica to talk a little bit about the transitional start unit. If Jessica is on over here. Yeah, hi, I'm here. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk about our transitional start unit here, which we started a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, any newly diagnosed ESRD patient um, comes through our uh, TSU program. They are run, um, here we run them in center um, through a four-week program. They are run on next stage machines, so they get a slower um, type of treatment or slower introduction into dialysis. And they run in this unit, um, we have a separate pod for them where they run separately for the first four weeks when they're brand new. And during this four week period, um, they just receive a lot of one on one education from various team members. Um, they get a lot of education from our physicians. They get a lot of one-on-one -on -one education from, um, from, we usually have a couple of nurses that circulate through that do education on labs, on dialysis itself, on modality education, um, and we really promote home therapies from that. They get education from our renal dietitians, um, social workers, we do um, some of the social workers, any financial stuff, screening, things like that that need to be done. And then we usually also have um, someone from our transplant team come and meet with the patient as well. Um, and, you know, the purpose of this is to, you know, to promote home therapies, but also just to improve patient outcomes because they receive a lot of education in the very beginning um, to we get earlier ac earlier referral for access placement, earlier referral for um, transplant referrals, um, and things of that nature. Other thoughts you had, Dr. Chopra? Yes, and uh, in the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the outcomes that we've had in uh, using the transitional start unit. If Jessica, you want to expand on this? Yeah, um, since starting our transitional start unit, we have increased our um, number of patients that have transitioned home, to a home modality, both PD and home hemo, um, as opposed to staying in center. Um, and you can see on the slide, we've had 33.3% 33 per, 33 .3 of our patients through the transitional start unit has chosen a home modality. Um, and this is an ongoing um, uh, unit, and what we are doing is everyone who is a crash start or urgent start in the hospital has to initially go through the transitional start unit in order to get expedited education, uh, modality choices, and then uh, see um, the care that they had not received in a CKD clinic. They try to get that in the transitional start unit before they transition to an in-center unit. So that's why uh, we have a very rigorous program where they can be uh, educated on different modalities. They can uh, work through different machines. Um, it's, it's good to do that because sometimes when someone is doing home hemodialysis, their blood pressure goes down, the number of binders used is less, and they can compare that with in-center dialysis where the blood pressure is higher, fluid restriction is much higher, number of binders is higher. So it's a quality of life for an individual person, and the transitional start unit allows them and gives them flexibility to understand how life can be with different forms of dialysis. And it's usually for the crash start patients uh, who have not had um, pre end stage renal disease or CKD care and are very new to this and are a little overwhelmed by the diagnosis that they are facing. Thanks, Jessica. I'm going to move to the next. I'm going to move to the next slide, which is whether we can expand care to the elderly. There are assist PD programs that are available in Canada and France, and assist PD is not yet approved 
in America, but there is a good possibility that SSPD can be approved in America, especially to our nursing home patients who are already on dialysis. And one has to keep in mind that whether they could be candidates to do doing cycler therapy overnight with the last fill, uh, as opposed to the cost that we uh, incur by transporting them from a nursing home to an in-center dialysis facility. So there is a lot of avenue in um, uh, pursuing assist PD by collaborating with local nursing homes and catchment areas in your program. Respite PD is something I have written here because it is a form of supportive therapy uh, at home prior to somebody transitioning to hospice. For example, if somebody is in two minds and they just want to try some form of dialysis before they come to terms with um, uh, end of life, then respite PD is also an option because the hemodynamic liability is much less with respite. Switching gears to transition. What I do honestly tell all my patients is when you are um, a kidney disease patient, you will have goals of trying to get a kidney transplant and we hope that the kidney transplant lasts you forever. But sometimes patients come back to CKD, they come back to going on dialysis. A lot of our dialysis patients, they switch around from in-center to peritoneum to uh, you know, home hemodialysis. The mindset that we want to inculcate in all our home therapies and in-center providers is that if someone is failing PD or if someone is transitioning or having technique failure, we should think of home to home transition rather than home to in-center transition. Thinking about having secondary accesses and AV fistula, remember that this patient is uh, wanting to be more uh, independent. They probably want to work. So they may be a good candidate for home. This is data on home to home transition. As you can see, the number is very less. It's like uh, 10 and 12 patients. But you can see there is decreased um, yeah, erythropoietin requirements, better nutritional status, phosphorus control. Most of them were younger patients with low, uh, fewer comorbidities. And, um, but the outcomes were very good and loss of renal function wasn't much. So residual renal function was better preserved. So peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis are not really in competition from each other. They are two, two different therapies. Home hemodialysis is a good choice for PD patients with PD-specific technique failure. This will allow them to be autonomous and independent as they wanted to. So what we wanted to summarize is that we need to stop obsessing about which modality gives the longest duration of survival. We need to focus on what is important to the patient. An urgent start program is very feasible. It obviates the need for a tunnel capital. Remodeling of PD delivery with telemedicine, expanding care to elderly with assist PD, and having a transitional start unit for your crash start patients. And a home first philosophy will help grow your home program and transitions can be made between home-based modalities. That was our talk. I do see some questions, yeah. Stephanie. Yeah, we've got quite a few in, and I'd like to jump right in. So um, I will go ahead and, you know, um, ask them if you would want. And then I, I think that we open for both you and probably Jessica, so whoever, or both. So the first question has, uh, has, has there been a study to show the difference in patients choosing home treatment if they've been educated prior to starting to di dialysis versus trying to convert patients who have already started in-center hemodialysis? No, the education data that I have is uh, from 2002-2003 from dialysis patients. There is no data uh, from CKD clinic yet regarding um, uh, how well are they getting educated about options. Um, that is the only data we have, and that's when they have already started dialysis. Um, the data that I presented, 50% of them uh, said they didn't even have a nephrologist before starting. Okay, great. Um, how are you doing urgent start with a catheter that is less than two weeks if you still need to refer for PD catheter placement? That is particularly for the crash start in the hospital or in the ICU. 
where someone is there and, you know, what happens in the hospital is we just put a tunnel catheter or a dialysis catheter or put a temperate catheter, then put a dialysis tunnel catheter. We extend their stay and then say go to an in-center unit and then start educating them. What we are trying to do, the, the good thing about urgent start is you can even do it as the first therapy uh, in the hospital. So that's where you do the expedited education and you try to explain them options. And if you need to get referral uh, for a PD catheter placement, then you need to involve the vascular surgeon and tell them, I need a PD catheter placed uh, in this patient in two days. I will do the colonoscopy prep and clean the bowels out. Please place a PD catheter for me. In our health system, the vascular surgeon even puts a fibrin glue at the tip of the, uh, in the cuff. So it gives us 48 hours to even do urgent start PD because the fibrin glue prevents leaks. So that is particularly when it is a crash start patient who has just shown up in the hospital and has never received education. So they are the ones you need to expedite the education and expedite referral. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, a question in from Deborah asks, um, does the weight of the patient affect whether a patient is a P candidate for PD? No, there is no absolute contraindication except that if you don't have an intact peritoneum. Everything else is um, a relative contraindication. We have patients who have urostomy, we have patients who, ha who are obese. What is important is Yes, the weight is important because the volume of distribution of urea will be a lot. What you must also remember that our peritoneal dialysis patients have a lot of residual renal function. They are probably starting with some amount of residual renal function and peritoneal dialysis will help preserve that uh, more so than a hemodialysis patient. They may need, if you're absolutely aneuric and you're more than 100, 112, 24 kilograms, you will at least need 15 liters of peritoneal dialysis uh, going through your uh, through a 24-hour period, which is very doable. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, maybe maybe uh, Jessica, maybe you can help. It says, where can I get a video education, a DVD for patients in the clinic? He, hemodialysis patients were educated by the PD nurse, and manual education materials were given, but they are requesting for a video to watch. Uh, can yep, someone so, tell me where to get these DVDs? Yep, so both um, Baxter and Fresenius, which produce PD supplies, have uh, DVDs available. Um, in most clinics, whoever your home nurses are, they can contact their um, nurse educator through Fresenius or DeVita, and they usually distribute those to the home clinics at no cost. Oh, great, great, thank you. I, and he did mention, wanted to know if Baxter was still making those, so I know. Thank you for that. Um, a, a question I think for you again, Jessica, is the pod, I'm referring to the TCU pod, on the main in center floor where, where you're doing this? It is, yeah. Um, our clinic here, um, we have one, two, three, four, five pods, so we designated one of them um, specifically for the TSU patients, and so we have that set up separately with the next stage machines, and um, and we just have it available for any new starts. Okay, uh, we have some more questions for you about your about your TSU unit. Um, do you have a standard dialysis prescription for these patients on next stage? Uh, for example, the flow fraction or the dialysate type. Um, yeah, we have a protocol that was written, so we kind of start them just like any new start at a lower um, prescription first and then work them up to the full uh, prescription. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I have another one. Is, is four weeks enough for the patients to decide a modality in the TCU unit at UVA? Um, I would say say most of the time. Um, I think you always will have some patients who need more time, but I think if you spend the time with them, that one-on-one -on -one time, and give them that education, we set up machines for them out there. You know, they're running on the next stage, so they get to see what that involves. 
we bring our PD um, equipment out there and demonstrate that for them as well so they get to see everything firsthand and get a lot of one-on-one -on -one education um, to have as much information as possible to help them make that decision. Yeah, I think right. the point is very early and often we have to educate them just so that uh, that's that's the key in education is early education and frequent education. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question probably for both of you. Have you had an in-center patient who would like to transition to home hemo, however, they don't have a partner, and how did you resolve it? T telemedicine? That was with a question mark. Well, we haven't, uh, I don't know if Jessica wants to go first, but I have had patients asking about solo home hemodialysis and that is approved. Uh, only thing that is needed is they need emergency preparedness. There needs to be a partner or somebody in their assisted living or wherever they are that needs to know what to do in case of a catastrophe. Um, uh, and that is the recommendation that only there is an emergency preparedness where someone needs to come and um, uh, get trained for that. Otherwise, solo home hemodialysis is possible. And with regard to telemedicine, you know, CMS has um, changed the laws and uh, two out of mm -hmm. the three home visits can be done through telemedicine. Right, the monthly thank you. Visits. Yes. Right, right, that's fairly new. Um, another kind of a question, it says, um, do you find patients who are designated to start home hemo that temporarily go to in-center are then resistant to transitioning to the home program? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, because home hemodialysis has different problems. What is important is to understand patient perspective. Usually, it's, it, for patients who are starting off fresh, it seems very uh, attractive to have a healthcare uh, professional like a nurse or tech taking care of them. And uh, the uh, fears and anxiety that they have about cannulation or uh, you know, uh, doing self-care can be real. So um, what really sways them is actually meeting another home patient. When there is someone mm -hmm. else who is dialyzing next to them, who has done home hemodialysis and is doing respite or is just here as a transition, can tell them that this is very doable, you can do this. The providers, the nurses need to work with them as to what is it in their environment that is being the limiting factor uh, to doing home hemodialysis. And understanding the perspective, trying to uh, allay their anxieties, and um, getting a good peer mentor uh, for the patients is very important. I once had a home hemo patient who came to my dialysis unit and was able to convince three other people to do home hemodialysis. So those kind of um, positive influencers really work. Right, great, great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, a question for probably both of you. Uh, what can the hemodialysis unit do besides education to encourage patients to consider PD? I think, I don't know if Jessica wants to try, Jessica, but uh, I think what is important is um, uh, what I have done is we have an isolation room and it is visible through a glass door to the in-center, I train my PD patients there. So what it does is it creates inquisitiveness amongst the patients who are already dialyzing. They see that mm -hmm. some therapy is happening there and ask questions, and then it becomes an educating opportunity. So one is to try and create uh, infrastructure in a way where all modalities are visible to the patients, especially training, uh, having um, uh, materials and uh, uh, you know video clips is always helpful, but what works out best is um, uh, focus groups, having um, uh, support groups, as well as um, 
if they can see someone dialyzing, sometimes that has been a deciding factor in switching them. Great, thank you. Jessica, did anything to add to that for in-center units? Um, yeah, I think the education is the main thing. I mean, educating the patients, but educating the staff, you know, the in-center staff that don't work in the home departments, um, educating them so that they understand the benefits of home therapies as well so they can, you know, give that, that information down to the patients. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got, we've got some time for a couple more, I think. Uh, I, uh, kind of a, quite, a question for you, Dr. Chopra. It says, can the doctor elaborate on urgent start using a new catheter? I thought I heard him say something about using glue. Yeah, I was talking about fibrin glue. Now, fibrin, uh, when the PD catheter is being inserted by the surgeon, this data comes from pediatric literature because a lot of the PEDS patients um, uh, do urgent start because their vessels are so small that a hemodialysis catheter cannot go. So the surgeon in the inner cuff will use a fibrin glue, and it's basically uh, going to prevent any leaks from the catheter, and uh, it gets reabsorbed in 48 hours. So when you're doing urgent start, for the first 48 hours is the best time to put a low-volume dialysis in the patient because that fibrin glue is going to prevent the leak. And that's the issue with urgent start. Nobody wants leaks. So we try to do it supine, um, and, and patients are not allowed to get up if they have PD fluid in them. But the fibrin glue, if, um, and I can share the paper with Stephanie, um, is um, if, if your surgeon or vascular surgeon or interventional radiologist or nephrologist can use that, would be a seal to prevent leak. It's Great. Okay, thank you. Um, and if you do have that paper and you want to send it to me, Dr. Chokopra, I will send it out when I send out all the post event material and the slide deck. Yes. I'd be glad to send that with along with that. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay. Some of the patients are reluctant about home therapy due to the fear of possible mortality from infection. What's the best way to ensure patients that will be that they will be thoroughly trained and supported throughout the modality transition? Well, what I always tell patients that, um, uh, as I pointed out, the outcomes of infections is not different and hospitalization is not different. In peritoneal dialysis, because they're doing exchanges all the time, uh, it's very easy to pick up an infection because a cloudy effluent is seen first. By the time pain sets in, uh, you know, it's a little too late because the infection has been rip-roaring. So uh, in PD, firstly, there are bugs which are easily treatable, and the infection is picked up so soon, which is much, much uh, better than a home, uh, than a hemodialysis patient where a bloodstream infection, of course, can have grave complications. So um, infection can happen, and of course, um, there will be aseptic techniques used in both modalities. Uh, we've created... Um, peritonitis checklist, hand washing checklist. Uh, we even ask our patients to pass all those tests so that um, they are well trained. We even check their hands with uh, the light to see if there is anything missing. So uh, training, reviewing technique, creating checklist, but also reassuring that if PD infection were to happen, it's very treatable and you will pick it up very early. Great, great, thank you. Uh, a question for Jessica. Jessica, with the TSU program, would you run the patient five days a week on the next stage or three days a week? Um, here we run them actually four days. We run Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there was, oh, here's, how is, uh, if, if any of you can address this, how are hospital RNs being educated to, so that they are able to educate patients from the hospital and make a more make it more easy when they get to the dialysis unit to reinforce the importance of PD at home. 
Well, I know here our renal nurse, uh, we have a renal team on the inpatient side, and then we have a uh, renal uh, specific case manager uh, who helps to refer patients to our transitional start unit. And um, often we will get a lot of referrals from the inpatient side for patients to provide modality education for, for crash starts that are interested in home dialysis. And also what can help is, um, is you know, sometimes in a hospital system, what helps is to train one floor, like the fifth floor of the hospital would be for the PD patients for patient safety. And it's very easier to train. Uh, you should have your renal nurse and um, as backup, but you, we also want to protect our nurses so that they don't get a lot of phone calls. It is also advisable to train the charge nurses of one floor or only one floor of the hospital in providing best PD care so that if someone has uh, any problem in the hospital uh, and they are a PD patient, the best care is provided on the fifth floor of the hospital, they need to go there. I understand if someone has an MI or they have you know, neurosurgical problems and they're on another floor or an ICU, the the fifth floor or whatever charge nurse is over there can be um, the middle person between the renal nurse and the ICU team in troubleshooting in the middle of the night if there was a problem. But focusing on three or four people or one floor may also be a good strategy for uh, patient safety and best outcomes in a PD patient. All right, thank you. Uh, let's, I think we have a uh, time for one more here. Is there a set number of times a patient can have an infection before PD is no longer an option? Well, if someone is having recurrent infections, on, I mean, it depends whether it is a relapsing infection or the infection never went and it is related to catheter seeding. That's what it's coming to. Or if someone has a fungal peritonitis, Someone has a fungal peritonitis, the catheter has to come out. It has grave consequences. A lot of scarring has happened in the abdomen. You have to give this patient at least six months to eight months before you can even rethink of peritoneal dialysis. Like I said, we need an intact peritoneum. If someone's having infection after infection, you have to think of what kind of bug is this bug seeding the catheter. The catheter is seeded, you know, you need to get the catheter out and make sure that their infection is treated before you go inside and start doing PD. Fungal peritonitis would be the only one I would say you need to wait really long before you venture going back in because the surgeon will tell you when they're going back in after eight months, this, this peritoneum is so scarred, I can't put a PD catheter in. So it's all on what bug, whether the catheter was infected and how severely is the peritoneum scarred. Right, thank you. And I think I will, there's a comment that came in that I think I'll close with that, uh, and then I'll go into just some um, information at the end. But uh, this is from Deborah. She says, not a question. In my area, we set up a home therapy chair at a sister clinic. The patient was asked to try it for two weeks to see if they could feel a difference in their health while on home hemo. Home hemodialysis were given by staff during the two weeks. If the patient verbalized an interest, training would start. We did have two to three patients that converted from in-center to home dialysis. So nice uh, success story uh, for Deborah there at her facility. I think that's a very important aspect. So um, I thank just you. want to, um, yeah, that was very good. And thank you, Dr. Copra and Jessica, for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule. Uh, to provide a lot of good information, a lot of good best practices here. I just want to go over a few things for the, our audience. I know uh, I'm going to put up there the evaluation process is very important, this, and obtaining CEUs. I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I have learned that Fresenius Medical Air is having some technical difficulties right now with SurveyMonkey. It's being blocked by their facilities. I know that because I got, you know, we've uh, we got some communication. So to everybody who is a Fresenius um, facility that's on the call, I will be sending you tomorrow morning. I'm going to run the attendance report from this call. I will now send out a email to all of you who are on today with information on how to get your CEUs because doing the SurveyMonkey is not going to work for 
for your for your group at this time. So please, if you're a Fresenius facility, uh, do not try to do the Survey Monkey. It will not work. I will be sending you out. It will be coming from the NCC, a separate email in the morning with instructions on how to get your CEU, CEUs. For everybody else, um, the process has changed a little bit. There's two ways you can go ahead and click the Survey Monkey link that's up there now. It will take you directly to the Survey Monkey. You can complete that, and then it will, if you want CEs, you can then stay on and it will uh, direct you on how to get CEUs. Um, the second way is around uh, 15 minutes after the hour, you will be getting an email from the NCC. It also will contain the same information. It will be a survey link, <clears throat> and um, you can also do that. So if you don't want to stay on the line and connect to this or you have trouble connecting to this survey, Monkey, you will also be getting the link in about 15 minutes from now. So again, for Fresenius facilities, no, no sense of trying to utilize the Survey Monkey. It is not working. I will send out some information tomorrow about how to get your CEUs. So again, I just want to thank everybody for coming on the call today, taking time out of their day. I know everybody's busy in their facilities. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Chopra and Jessica Jenkins for join, joining us today. And uh, this will end our uh, presentation for the day. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie, for Thank having you. us. And Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye.